Ready? Ready. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. My name is Patrick Derek Pan. I'm the founder of Quirkin Inc., the world's largest online news hub on the Cambodian diaspora. This morning, we have the honor of interviewing Miss Anita Chun of Seattle. Welcome. Hi. Hi. How are you uh, this this Monday morning? I'm doing good. Just waking up still. <laughs> Do you have your breakfast yet? Yeah, I had some peaches and some apple juice. <laughs> I see. Today, today we wanted to talk to you about a few things. Um, most importantly, what we're curious to understand is your your work as a chef. That's how Clark and viewers uh, found out about you through your work, through your recent pop up. Uh, to begin, share us a little bit about your. Um, your current uh, profession as a chef? Uh, so right now I'm just doing my own projects. Um, I also do catering, so I do kosher catering. Um, besides that, I don't really cook besides at home. So um, yeah, that's kind of, I'm also doing like another little project where um, I make cakes and raw foods. Um, so a lot of the cooking is just kind of um, on my own. I don't really cook in a restaurant or anything. Um, so the pop-up was kind of my first time back in a restaurant in a couple of years. Mm, in a couple of years, okay. Or maybe a year. It wasn't, but no. you, but you <laughs> cook uh, professionally for a restaurant, right? Yes. What's the name of the restaurant? And what kind of cuisine is it? Um, well, I worked at Kraken Kanji which is, um, they make baba or like rice soup, porridge, um, and like Asian fusion food. And uh, before that I worked in a French restaurant um, and I've mainly been in like French restaurants as a cook. So that's more my background. I see, so you have a French cuisine, um, also Mexican? Cuisine? Mexican, yes, but I, w I haven't, I didn't cook that long. At, in the Mexican kitchen, but yeah. So how many years professionally have you uh, been a chef? Um, I've been working in kitchens for about 10 years. 10 years, wow. 10 years, 11, almost 11 years, yeah. 11 years, great. Yep. How did you get into, um, how did you get into becoming a chef? Didn't you study something else when I first knew you back at UW? Um, yeah, I wanted to, like, <laughs> what did I want to do? I wanted to uh, own a business, actually, own a restaurant. Um, uh, so that's actually what I was going to UW for. Um, but I got into food because my dad makes really good food. <laughs> my family makes really good food. And food for me has just always been, like, full of good memories and, like, family, um, going to temple where we got a huge spread of food and just, you know. Um, so for me, it's like the happy memories is my childhood. Um, and then just having, being lucky and having to experience really, really good food. Um, yeah. And your, father, and your father made all types of cuisine or just mainly Cambodian cuisine? Um, he makes, he makes uh, Cambodian and Chinese um, and like Vietnamese cuisine, but yeah, he makes a, he makes a wide range of food. <laughs> I see. So you, it's good to say then that your father was probably one of your uh, biggest influences influences in becoming a chef. That's Definitely, true. yeah. Uh, my dad, my mom, my uh, grandparents. Um, I come from a family of like really well-fed people. <laughs> well-fed people, I see. <laughs> well, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't been invited to your, any of your home settings yet to see what kind of, how, how, how things are, but I can, I, I take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> You're invited to the next one. <laughs> I just intruded myself. I just invited myself. <laughs> so, you grew up in the Seattle area. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Your um, one, yeah, um, I grew up. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Seattle, um, like in the south end of Seattle, and I went to 
you know, Washington Middle School, Garfield High School, and then I went to the University of Washington. Um, and I met you at the University of Washington, uh, maybe, actually when I was still in high school, I um, decided to dabble it with you guys in college. That's right, that's right. <laughs> you came in with uh, another friend of ours, enjoyed, enjoyed in the Khmer Club meetings. So that was like one of your early exposures to Cambodian culture at a very uh, young age, you know? Yeah, it was my first experience being forced to speak Khmer to like a peer. <laughs> because before that, like I would only, like I don't even speak Cambodian to my, gra to my parents my grandparents because they don't understand English. Yeah. So it really like pushed me out of the box at that time to like be able to like have casual conversation with people. All right. I remember those was I remember those was <laughs> So most of the training as a chef that all most much of it is did you get any uh sort of culinary uh, education? Uh, any um, formal education for, for, for cooking? Yeah, so after um, the UW, I went there for a couple of years, and then I left and actually went to culinary school. Um, and pastries was actually my first love. Like, I baked a lot of cakes when I was younger and just really loved desserts, but I felt like it was, I don't know, intimidating or something, like the perfectionism of, like, pastries. So I decided to do the culinary side because I didn't know how to cook. I couldn't cook. I couldn't even make like fried rice when I first started. Really? Um, In college you don't know how to make fried rice? That was easy. To no. <laughs> wow. No, my roommate taught me how to make like mm -hmm. bacon fried rice or something and that was like the first time. Um, and I remember I was like 19, like still going to UW and didn't know how to cook anything. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> So you got formal, so you got some formal education in cooking at a at, at a culinary academy in Seattle. You got a lot of uh, personal training through your family, through your mom, your dad, grandparents. Did you get any type of training or mentorship from those um, from like non Cambodian staff or like from from your time perhaps visiting Cambodia? What's your, what's your relationship with Cambodia and, and the food? Um, so I definitely got a lot of training just learning how to use and cook food. Um, after graduating, I worked in a bunch of restaurants, um, and that's where I learned, like, you know, basic foundation stuff. Um, and then it wasn't, like, I never really tried to cook my food for myself because, one, my family could make it better, um, <laughs> and two, they would always kick me out of the kitchen whenever I tried to cook. So <laughs> they'd be like, "Whatever your formal training is for, I don't know what it's for." Um, <laughs> but so I didn't really cook Cambodian food until after I visited Cambodia, which was yeah. uh, about four years ago. Um, and there, I stayed for a couple of months, and I learned um, from family and. Um, like cousins and stuff, how to cook basic dishes. Um, and then I also got to experience the flavors, which um, here it's like definitely a little bit watered down, I feel like, just because we don't have a lot of the same things. Um, so there I was able to kind of recognize like where the flavors my parents try were trying to imitate came from. Um, <laughs> I was about to say, uh, I had something tip of my tongue when you were talking about that. Uh, oh yeah, how would you distinguish Cambodian food as a Cambodian American chef who specializes in a few cuisines? How would you describe to someone who's never tried Cambodian food? How would you describe that food? Um, it's really. For me, it's been difficult to kind of differentiate it between like Vietnamese food and Thai food because it is really similar. We're all from like a really similar region, but I think that um, the major difference is we like things kind of funky. Okay. I mean, I know. Well, 
yeah, like, you know, like, Vietnamese food is, like, a little funky, but it's, like, it's not, at, there's not as much, like, hook or, like, fermented, like, paste in there, um, or maybe that's just my perception of it, I don't really know, um, but in Cambodian cuisine, there's, like, a lot of fresh herbs and um, roots that are used to season everything, so, like, krung is our base, um, and there's many different types of krung depending on the person, depending on, like, where you're from, depending on which dish you're making, um, and, s but that essentially is, like, for me, the basis of Khmer cooking, there's gurung in almost everything, um, but not everything. So, <laughs> so it's and, and it has a foundation um, known as gurung, which is a it's a sort of a concoction of ingredients to use as the the base flavoring of of most Cambodian dishes, right? Yes, and typical gurung will have um, shallots. Mm. Uh, lemongrass, garlic, mm. um, kaffir lime leaf, and galangal. We don't use that much ginger, but we do use ginger um, in things. And then there's like finger rhizome that's in some dishes that aren't in a lot of dishes. Um, but yeah, that's your basic one. And then people will add like chilies or turmeric or um, stuff like that to it. Why do you think? Why do you think Cambodian cuisine hasn't really um, as popular as other regional uh, dishes like our neighbors to the east and the west? Uh, do you have an opinion on why you think uh, mainstream America has yet to adopt uh, Cambodian cuisine? Um. Well. I don't know, I can't speak for, you know, the whole nation, but in my experience, <laughs> the whole nation, no, um, in my experience, personally, like, my, like, asking my mom, like, why, why don't we open, like, a Cambodian restaurant or something like that, she's always expressed, well, no one would be interested. It's, like, very peasant food. It's very humble food. It's, like, super basic. No one would ever want to eat it outside of the home. Um, so that was kind of like her opinion. For me, I think that it just hasn't come yet. Like we, this like the older generation was, I felt like very busy trying to survive here and adapt and adjust. And then the second generation now has a little bit more freedom for creativity, for, you know, living the American dream or, um, something like that. So I just don't think it's happened yet, and I think that it's happening now. I think that a lot of, like, um, a lot of people my age, and also there were, like, there are few older people that definitely set the standard and staple. Like, there's Phnom Penh Noodle House in Chinatown, and he's been around for, like, 20 years or 25 years or something like that. Um, you know, and... But also... So, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know why. <laughs> like, why? Why haven't we? Can we, like, get that out? But you said you feel like uh, there is an emergence, there is a growing interest in mainstream America to adopt new cuisines like like mine. You feel optimistic that that is a direction that, um, that we're going into? Yeah. Yeah, I think that it's definitely happening now. Definitely. I, I, uh, on Clarkin recently, you saw the news about a young, um, a young Cambodian American chef from uh, from the the Bay Area. She was in a competition called Chops, which is a very oh, yeah. food channel. And her name is um, I just retrieved it. Her name is Sofina Ua. She cooks there in a, in a open restaurant. But she took she took first place, right? And it's a pretty good deal because it's very competitive, and these are really trained, seasoned uh, chefs from around the U.S. who have de decades, sometimes, of experience. So I do just want to add that I think I think um, there are growing interest in uh, in uh, Cambodian cuisines, especially in like Asian-populated communities like the Seattle's, like the Oakland's.
recently I saw another pop up in uh, Brooklyn where there's very little Cambodians, but it's it's a place where you know uh, the city would embrace it because it's different. It's uh, it's exciting for them, and uh, they were doing pop ups as well. So, any plan for you to have a brick and mortar? Um. Yeah, if there's enough interest, I definitely would do it. Um, this was kind of like a first trial. I wasn't sure if people were, one, interested in Khmer food, or two, that I could make it. So, um, yeah, definitely. If um, I'm going to be doing more pop-ups, and depending on, like, funding and interest and um, locations and things like that, I am definitely have that in the future. How was the reception for the previous uh, pop-up that, uh, that I participated in? Can you share us, like, your overall observation of, of that day? Of the pop-up that we just had? Yeah. Um, Did you sell out all your food? No, but that's because we would have sold out. Yeah. We didn't sell out because of technical difficulties, but there were enough people that probably would have sold out. Um, so I really only did like one or two Facebook posts. So everyone that came um, was connected to my network. Um, and then also I put flyers out into the neighborhood where the restaurant was. So there were a lot of neighborhood people. And I was really surprised by how many people were interested that were not Cambodian, um, that that were Cambodian, um, and like found it somehow. Um, and yeah, there was like a ton of interest. We had a full house by 7:30, um, and it's a hundred-seat restaurant, so it was quite intense. Um, we definitely didn't have enough. Yeah, <laughs> totally. We didn't have enough staff, um, and I pulled friends from their table while they were eating mm -hmm. to like help me because at a certain point I had to go out of the kitchen and take some orders, and then then I had to go back into the kitchen and cook the orders. So I got a friend to like come help me take over the tables and things like that. So it was kind of a mess because there wasn't like, we weren't prepared for it all, but um, we survived, we sold a bunch of food. I think for the most part, people were happy and people liked it. Um, I'm definitely going to make some changes to some recipes and things like that. Um, but overall, like, it kind of blew me away. Like people were so interested and really happy to like have something different, um, and familiar at the same time for those that are, you know, Cambodian. Um, and yeah, it was really fun. What was um what was their favorite dish based off the feedback you got from your friends and, and guests? Um, I think the lo cha was everyone's favorite dish. Either the lo cha or um, the seko ang. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had both dishes and I can concur those were really good dishes, you know. Thank you. It's like mom's kitchen. Your mom's in the kitchen, though, right? My mom was in the kitchen. <laughs> My mom was totally, totally in the kitchen. She was like tasting everything and being like, this needs more fish sauce. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, she like, she was there like during the planning and everything. She actually came up with a name. Oh, um, huh? The name is from my mom. It's um, so for like people that don't know what Kirito means, it's a national park in Cambodia, like about an hour from Phnom Penh. Yes. Um, and for my mom, that was like her happy place. Um, like they would, my family would go to vacation there all the time. And um, it also means like happy mountain or a mountain of joy or something. But my dad actually told me that it means like, like Kiri means like, a place that's like cold or a Kiridom, like a place that's colder. So this mountain is actually like, has a colder climate than most other mountains around as far as I'm aware. And he says that pine trees grow there. 
So I thought it was very fitting because I was like, oh, it's like Seattle in Sukhmai and like, you know, vice versa. And it's also like a very happy memory for my mom. So I see. Oh, that's that's beautiful. I didn't see the I didn't get to hear the connections when we first talked about the choice of uh, picking that name. Because there used to be a kid at home up in Linwood, I was sharing with you, um, ran by a Cambodian French family in the early 2000s. But, um, they specialize in bread dishes, but it was it was amazing. So it's good to see a, a revival of that name for, for, for Cambodian cuisine. Are they still active? No, to my knowledge, they've been, uh, they've been out of business for a while since I graduated. I think they were operating until like 2006 or 2007. Um, but yeah, I uh, had fond memories of them because we would always drive up from the south side or from the new district area just to, just to have a bowl of, uh, they made this like, mean bowl of a uh, coco with bread. But they had like a $50,000 bread machine from France. They were like really, Bread snobs. They were like really proud. They always give you tours. If you're Cambodian, you go to Canada, they will give you a, a tour in their kitchen. Really? I'm so sad I missed it. It's a lovely couple, you know. And, uh, and I wonder what they're doing uh, now. What's that? I said, I wonder what they're doing now. They're probably in the food business somewhere. Um, I think they were trying to diversify um, their cuisine. Um, uh, so it can be more um, accessible to the general public, you know. I think if I want to share one, one one opinion to you about Cambodian cuisine, why I think it hasn't been working, I don't think it's the food. We all can concur that it's not the food that's deterring people from maintaining its business. I think it's just it's just the it's the other aspects of running a business. It's the marketing. It's the it's the advertising. It's the presentation. It's location. It's, it's it's really on the other end. That's really, um, I think that's uh, that's causing a lot of instability in some of the Cambodian businesses in the past. Like I remember when we had Ida, Anita, um, there was always a Cambodian restaurant on the end, but it was always like one year and it's gone, two years and it's gone. It's never very. It's not like Tan Lee or the Tan brothers. They're on the end where, you know, they have good word of mouth. They have good PR. They have online presence. All these stuff, I think, is what keeps them running. It's not like, it's not really the price. It's not really the food. The food is quality, you know, for the most yeah. part. All, all the restaurants in the area. Yeah, like there's a really great restaurant in Tacoma called uh, Mitha Pia. I don't know if you've ever been there, but their food is amazing. And the location is terrible. Like. There, well, I went there to go eat, and they heard me talking about like cooking and stuff. They offered to sell the restaurant. They're like, do you know anyone that wants this restaurant? Because, like, the location is terrible, and yeah, I think that Wait, no one is marketing for that. Where is that? Like in the east side, in the south side? I don't actually know, but I can like email a link or something. Um, but it's called Mid the Pia. Yeah. Yeah. So it it's, in, it's in Tacoma. And it's really phenomenal. Like the food is really quality. Really quality, super authentic, like, deli like it's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's re it took us and like my friend and I an hour and a half to get there. Mm -hmm. There was no one else in the restaurant, and she was like, "We're gonna try to close the restaurant down already." So, yeah. Well, there, it's going to require a new generation of Cambodian American chefs to revive it, and we're pretty optimistic that uh, you continue with your success with uh, Kiri Rom. Do we know? Do we know the next date for Kiri Rom yet? To, to our viewers, we don't know the next date yet. I'll be announcing it on the Facebook page, which is um, Kiri Rom PNW. So, yeah, yeah. and. Um, there I'll be like posting updates and stuff. Um, also on my personal Facebook page, I'll be posting stuff. Also, if you have any suggestions on where I can like tell people about it, because I don't really have like any other outlet to tell people. <laughs> um, we'll do our best on our end to, uh, to uh, promote it. Um, I was about to say, uh, so you drop us. So you gave us um, all the social media channels or handles for for Kirom. Is there 
Is there anything that uh, you want to tell your fans, your followers, or friends uh, about Kiridom in terms of ways that they can uh, support um, your efforts? Um, just come eat some food. Um, come join us. And I think that's the best way to support. Um, share a post and get other people interested. Um, Khmer food is like super underrated <laughs> and it's really, really good. And um, I really want to share it. Also, if people have like a dish that they want to see that they've grown up with or like there's there was so many dishes that I wanted to do but I couldn't you know I couldn't have like 20 dishes on the menu for the first one so we cut it down to nine which isn't very much um so I'm open to you know like the next one I'm doing I know where the location is I haven't set a date yet but we're doing a smaller like brunch type menu um so, yeah, just any suggestions, any feedback, any... Welcome all, right? You, you yeah. Welcome all the critical <laughs> feedback from, my, from grandmas and grandparents who, uh, who, uh, who make the food, right? You, you welcome all criticism, right? All criticism. Yeah. You can tell me what you think. <laughs> well, on that note, I'm going to tell you that it was a little sweet on the, on the lowdown. <laughs> It was a little sweet. The flavor was amazing, though. <laughs> that I cannot sugarcoat at all. It was the flavor was just like an explosion. But uh, I, I tend to prefer like the saltier like side. I don't like it bland, but I felt it was a little bit sweet for my palate. Uh, that I think is a personal preference. Like my dad, for some for some reason, he puts sugar in his tequila. Like he puts a couple package of sugar. And I don't know anyone that does that because it's already my dad does that too. <laughs> yeah, too. See, so people have different preferences, but uh, yeah, definitely. You know, for those who are watching us uh, uh, in the in the down upload, uh, definitely reach out to Anita. Oh, Anita, uh, Anita, what's what's your email address? What email address, or can people reach out to you if they want to give feedback uh, and suggestions and stuff like that? Is there a public one you have? Um, yeah, they can email me at a c h h u n at gmail dot com. That one I check often. Um, okay. Yeah, and I will actually thought about having like a condiments thing on the table with like the tay and um, some chilies and stuff like that, so people can adjust their seasonings because they have that all over Sakmai, but I didn't get that far. So <laughs> next up, right? I I felt like there was another one before that. Was there not? No, that was the first one. Oh. Yeah. So. There was definitely. There was another guy that was doing a pop up. I thought it was for you. I thought it was you for something. Because I knew there was another there was another Cambodian pop up before your event in yeah, Seattle. FYI. Oh, really? Yeah. Who was I'll doing it? Because I remember seeing it, and I, I didn't. I forgot who was the chef. I don't think it was you though. But I, but I thought it was like connected to you. But yeah, oh. I'll be before you. So someone is doing it. Oh man, I should have gone to eat there. <laughs> Support the homies. <laughs> What's that? I said I should have gone to eat there. Yeah, yeah. but I think it was uh, I think it was a while back, like early summertime, because I was still in Cambodia when it happened. Yeah. Okay. Last but not least, um, is there any Is there any news that you wanted to share with us uh, that you're working on related to your chef or any travels? Anything that you want to share? Uh, any future projects that you want to share to our audience? Before we wrap things up, um, well, besides Giridom, um as a pop up, which I'll be continuing on um, for the next year at least, um, I'm doing another uh, project called the Sweet Life Bakery, and it's like raw, gluten free, dairy free desserts and sugar free too. I also do like cooked desserts, but that I'm kind of like jump starting that company, and I'm starting to sell cakes at. Um, a couple cafes and people are ordering them for me so that's kind of my other project which you can also find like on my Facebook page um, yeah that's what's going on with me the don't really have any travel plans for the future right now the sweet life the sweet life yeah okay. sweet life bakery um, although it would be really fun to do a pop-up in California 
Mm-hmm. Well, let me know. Our, our base is strong there in Skullcow. I will let you know. See if I can figure that out somehow. <laughs> but Anita, Anita, uh, Anita, keep on saying Anita. Anita, thank you for um, for joining us today. Thank you for uh, enduring the, the little technical difficulty we had this morning. Um, we look forward to um, following your progress and your work. And uh, feel free to always share it with us. And I know our fans are uh, very supportive of you know, entrepreneurs like yourself. So we want to just wish you the best of luck with um, the room, the sweet life, and all that you do uh, in, in raising the profile of Cambodian food. Thank you, Patri, for being there, for supporting, um, for just like everything that you've done for me in the past and in the present. Um, and yeah, I hope to like share more delicious food with you in the future. Um, and I'm very honored to like have be on this platform with you. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and yeah, hope to feed you soon. Definitely. And uh, last thing, I'm sure you're pretty open. If, if there was young chefs that wanted some type of mentorship or type of uh, uh, support, you more than uh, you would you would welcome those type of inquiries, correct? Definitely. And actually, um, there is a a program called the Collaboratory in uh, the neighborhood that I'm in, um, where I can teach classes if pe- enough people are interested. So if people are interested, give me an email and I'll set up a class or something. How, how many minimum? Like 10? 5? Like 4. 4? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it would be free. So just come on down. <laughs> oh, wow. You need to tell us. You need to share that with us in private. Uh, we can easily get more people to, to come. <laughs> yeah. Give us tutorials, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Well, Anita, uh, thank you again, and uh, we look forward to following your progress. You have a good morning, and uh, we'll we'll be in touch again. Okay, thanks, Patrick. You too. Bye.